So on behalf of the Council of Elders, the pastors, the leaders of BBTC, I'd like to wish everyone here a very blessed Christmas. In particular, for any of you who are here for the first time, maybe it's to see your family member, your friend get baptized. Maybe it's Christmas Day and you just wanted to come back into a church and experience Christmas in the house of God. Um, welcome. Thank you for choosing to spend Christmas morning with us. So let's start with a moment of prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you for the Christmas gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that the true joy of Christmas is knowing you. That the true meaning of Christmas is remembering you. Teach us to focus on your message that Christmas isn't just about the street lights and the presents and the Christmas trees, but really it's all about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is a really unique time of the year because everybody, not just in Singapore, but around the whole world, whether or not they're Christian, this is the time of year that they declare the name of God. Because Jesus is the Christ in Christmas. So you know that every time anyone says Merry Christmas, regardless of race or religion, in truth, they are proclaiming the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know if you have noticed it, but every year, the buzz around Christmas starts earlier and earlier and earlier, right? Uh, this year, I started hearing uh, Christmas carols in shopping malls as early as uh, October in the year. I don't know if you noticed it. And if you walk out on the streets, uh, you'll see the lights and the sound. And this year, there's a little bit of controversy because some people are saying, has Christmas become too commercialized? Is Christmas about Jesus Christ or is it about Mickey Mouse? This is, this is uh, right in front of Tang, CK Tangs. If you know, the shopping center is run by a Christian. In fact, they used to be closed on Sundays, but now they open on Sundays. And they do their best, be joyful in hope. They put a Christmas message out there. But when I went down the Orchard Road, no one was looking at that message. Everyone was looking at that Disney, Disney princesses, Woody, Buzz, and all that. Um, so I'm going to show you a video to explain the real meaning behind Christmas. It's a short video. It's not a very special video. It's a pretty generic video. But I want you to watch it because A, it gives you a brief primer about Christmas for those of you who don't really understand Christmas. But more important to me is I want you to keep an eye out for the end credits at the end where it shows you who made this video. Okay, so let's just watch this uh, one, two minute video. Ho, ho, ho. See the end credits? Do you see who played that? MCCY, Ministry of uh, Culture, Community, and Youth. Um, the story of Christmas is being spread, propagated by none other than our own government on their social media feeds. Uh, they're telling the world who Jesus is, who we believe Jesus is. And um, so you see how this season is really sent by God as a chance for us Christians to tell, to talk a little more freely about God. 
if even the government can be a little bit more relaxed about what they're allowed to say about religions and about who God is and about who Jesus is, then, then, then so should we. If even the government is talking about Jesus, who are we to not proclaim His name? So here in BBTC, we had uh, just had our biggest Christmas, pr- Christmas production ever. Hannah and the Toymaker. How many people were here to, to watch Hannah and the Toymaker over the weekend? Excellent. Very good that you were there and very good that you actually made it here for a, a second, third time this week. Uh, we know many churches uh, don't necessarily have a service today. So for those of you who might be here from another church, just welcome as well. Um, you want to hear the good news about Hannah and the Toymaker? Uh, more than 4,000 people filled the sanctuary to watch Hannah. There were another four, 500 people at the children's program. 108 adults received Christ at the altar call after Hannah. A further uh, 218 people rededicated their lives to God. And at the children's program, 59 children received Christ. Can we give God a hand for the work He has done through the drama production? 108 people received Christ over two days and a further 59 children uh, through the hard work, through the dedication, through the months of sacrifice, through the months of effort of about 100 cast, crew, and volunteers, um, by the grace of God, they did it. Uh, just, just a little bit of, of this. To my simple mind, you know how when you are born in Singapore, you receive a birth certificate, right? So to my simple mind, uh, when, when someone is born again, when someone receives Christ and they're born again, I think that they receive something like a rebirth certificate. Like, like some kind of sal- salvation BC. And just like on your real birth cert, it will list your time of birth, your place of birth, KKH, your date of birth, uh, your father and your mother. The way I see it, that rebirth cert, there will be a time of birth. And for 108 people and 59 children, that time of birth will be listed as 20, December the 22nd and 23rd. The place of birth will be at BBTC during Hannah. And the, the, the father, the mother, apart from the person who invited this family member, this friend, there will also be an additional 100 plus names. The cast and the crew and the directors and the script writers and the volunteers and the ushers and the car park marshals. And everyone it took to make that happen will have a little bit of the share in the harvest of righteousness. And that's why as a church, we do what we do. That's why as a church, we all come together because we are one body of Christ with a commission to bring people, to snatch people from the fire, to bring them, give them ultimate hope, ultimate salvation, and a passageway into heaven. And everyone who was involved in that, your name, you have a share of the credit. Whether you were up here on stage, you were back there at the back, you were down there at the kids' program, you're out at the car park, that was on you as well. So thank you for all of your part in it. Can we just give everyone involved another round of applause for their hard work, their investment over Hannah. And for sure, we weren't the only ones. Churches everywhere around Singapore, around the world were all hosting dramas and concerts and celebrity testimonies and so on this past weekend. And, and Christmas, the, the lead up to the Christmas is always a time of real buzz, you know, where people really proclaim the name of Jesus loudly and proudly, and as it should be. Because for all the Christmas lights and all the, 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 the whatever's piped in over the shopping centres, Jesus is truly the reason for this season. It's the reason we gather here today on this Tuesday morning. But what's funny is if you take all of this buzz, all of this very public proclamation about God, and you compare it to the lead up to the very first Christmas 2,000 years ago. Because back then, 2,000 plus years ago, the lead up, the build up to the first Christmas was quite the opposite. Back then, The build-up to the birth of Jesus, which is what Christmas celebrates, was silence. Or what must have felt like silence. It must have seemed like silence because back then, 2,000 years ago, the people, the nation of God in Israel was silenced. They were held down by, by foreign invader after foreign invader. And it must have felt silent because the prophets of God, those who speak on God's behalf, were silent. And if you look in your Bible, there was no recorded prophecy for generations leading up to that first Christmas. And so it must have seemed like God Himself was silent. Not just for a day, or a week, or a year, or a generation, but for more than 400 years. Why more than 400 years? Let me just explain this a little bit. 
Some of you will know that the Bible is not arranged chronologically. In other words, when you read the Bible, it's not in the order that it happened in history. Right? Broadly speaking, the Bible is arranged according to the type of book. So you start with, with uh, something like history books, and then you have poetry books, then you have uh, the books of the prophets, the gospels, the letters to the churches. It's arranged that way rather than in chronological order. But there is one point in the Bible where the chronology, the time sequence, is accurate. Uh, this is the point between the Old Testament, before Jesus, and the New Testament, which starts with the birth of baby Jesus. If you read through the Old Testament and you realize it's not chronologically arranged, then you come to the last three books of the Old Testament as Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and those, as far as historians can agree, are really the last books that were written before Jesus came. And Malachi was probably written around 440, 400 BC. And you flip the page from Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and you flip the page and you reach the New Testament. And in my Bible, there is literally just one blank page between Malachi and Matthew. And that one page, that one blank page, is 400 years long. That one page, that's the silence before Christmas. And that's a very long time to go without hearing from God. And maybe some of us know what it feels like to have that one blank page still ongoing in your life. Maybe some of us here have been waiting to hear from God. Maybe you've been waiting for an answer to your prayer. Maybe you're looking, waiting on a sign or a direction on a decision that you need to make. Maybe you've never heard from God before, but you're searching for something that, that's bigger, deeper, more meaningful in your life than whatever else is currently in your life. And maybe you've been waiting for a while. I, I don't think you've been waiting for 400 years, I'm sure. But as we all know, when you're waiting on something, when you've put forth a prayer and the answer is yet to come, when you have to make a decision and, and you still haven't got that wisdom, that download on it, when you're waiting like that, time moves very, very slowly. And then you start to get impatient and frustrated or worried and tired. And you start asking questions like, God, are you really there? If this describes you, then I hope that together today we can discover the lesson to be learned in the timeline, in the years, in the decades, the centuries leading up to that first Christmas. Because was God silent in that 400 years? I just state this up front just to dispel any doubt that God may appear silent at times, but you have to know this, God is always at work. God is always moving. Always and the reason it might feel like God was silent between Malachi and Matthew, what are known as the intertestament years, between the two testaments, the reason it might feel God is silent is because during this time there was an absence of recorded prophecy. It may feel silent because, well, in my Bible there is a blank page, and when you try to read out a blank page, it sounds like silence. But just because we may not literally hear God speaking, it doesn't mean that God isn't moving. Just because He doesn't speak in a way that we might want to hear Him, uh, at the timing that we want to insist from Him, it doesn't mean that He's not right there with you, working for all of the things that you, he, he knows you need in your life. To quote Hannah and the toy maker, He makes no mistakes. During that 400 years, God may not have been speaking audibly, out loud, through His prophets. But today we're going to learn how God's actions always speak louder than words. Because that page might be blank, because, but we know that God was not silent. During that 400 years, instead of speaking out loud, He was orchestrating events. He was redefining history. He was planting and uprooting kings and rulers. He was playing chess on a global scale with empires just to do one thing, to give us hope. And Israel, at the end of the Old Testament, needed hope. Because you see, at the end of the Old Testament, around the time of Malachi, a very sad picture of Israel was being painted, where everything in the land of Israel, the nation of God, seemed hopeless. And on the screen, you see listed all the sins of Israel, where they offered 
useless fires, where their, preach, their, their, their priests, the teaching of their priests caused many to stumble, where the priests were corrupt, where the people were, were, were unfaithful to their wives. And this is the point where God declares, I hate divorce. And then God says, you robbed me. How do we rob you? The people reply. You rob me through your half-hearted tithes and offerings. And all of these sins of the people, and we all have our own sins in our lives, and we kind of know what it feels like to, to sometimes uh, rob God, to, to, to rob people the wrong way. All of these sins, because of all of these sins, God said to the people in Malachi that surely the day is coming. But what day? Unfortunately for the evildoers, for those who persisted in their evil, judgment day was coming. Where the refiner's fire was about to come, some would be found wanting. But on that same day, for those who stay faithful to God, God also had another promise. God says, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And what God was saying was this, the day of the rising of the sun is coming. The day when righteousness will be restored, when healing will be released. Hope is coming. And this is at the end of the Old Testament and this is the, the cliffhanger at the end of the story. This is the teaser telling you to look out for this, to wait for this because hope is on the horizon. Because hope is just around the corner. And that hope would come in the form of a baby boy. Born that first Christmas, we commemorate his birthday today, and that baby boy's name was Jesus. And the birth of Jesus, that baby boy, was what we call the fulfillment of prophecy. Because throughout the Old Testament, God spoke through the prophets. And the prophets, they prophesied, they spoke God's word, and they told people, look beyond their sinfulness, look beyond their despair and their hopelessness, because hope is coming, because God is going to send someone to save us all by His grace, by His mercy. God was going to send a saviour, someone to save us, a messiah. And some scholars believe that all these prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament, that there are more than 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. And the prophecies are specific enough that the mathematical probability of uh, the birth and the life of Jesus fulfilling every single one of these prophecies is as near as impossible. It's staggeringly improbable. And there was a professor at the Department of Mathematics at Pasadena College. His name was Peter Stoner. And he just chose eight, not all three, and he just chose eight of those prophecies about Jesus. And he and his students worked on the math and they concluded that the probability that a man, Jesus, in his birth, his life, his death, could fulfill just those eight prophecies, uh, that he could satisfy that probability, was one in 10 to the power of 17. Right? So you put a one and then 17 zeros behind it, 10 to the power of 17. The probability that the birth, life, death of Jesus could fulfill the eight prophecies in the Bible was one in 100 million, billion, gajillion, zillion. Right? In other words, for the birth, life, death, resurrection of Jesus to take place and fulfill all of the prophecies about Him, it is too much of a coincidence to merely be coincidental. It cannot be accidental. And from this we realize that God had planned this all along. It was all part of God the Father's grand, great, cosmic plan. And so the silence before Christmas, those 400 years, it seems like silence. But in truth, it's God at work making sure that everything was in place to fulfill every scripture that pointed to the coming of Jesus. God left no stone unturned. Geopolitics, national boundaries, languages. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some of the events that took place in this supposedly silent years to fulfill the prophecies that foretold the birth of Jesus. And we do this with one simple reason. It is to help us understand that God's promises always come true. God's promises are yes and amen in His powerful name. What we do is we take all of these prophecies and we see exactly what it took God to make them come true, to make them happen. And on our part, what we need to do then is we need to learn to see things on His 
timeline, in his perspective, on his scale, so that we can understand that we can always trust in God's word, in God's will, and in God's promises. There's many prophecies about the birth of Jesus. Today, we'll look at just three prophecies. The first one we'll look at is the prophecy that the Savior will be born in Israel, in David's family line. All right. This came as early as Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24 was written approximately 1,400 years before Jesus was born. So very, very far back, this prophecy had already been released. And in, this, uh, in Numbers it says, I see him but not now. Actually, wait a while. It's, I behold him but not near. He's 1,400 years away. A star will come out of Jacob and a scepter will rise out of Israel. Prophecy that the Savior will be born in Israel. And then about the, the, the prophecies that will come through David's family line, this is from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was written about 700 years after that book of Numbers, but this is still 700 years before the birth of Jesus, right? And in Isaiah, it says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David, therefore this is the David, King David's family line. And a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding and counsel and might and knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now, the main thing that had to happen for these prophecies to be fulfilled is that the nation of Israel had to survive. From 1,400 years ago to 700 years ago, the nation of Israel could not be wiped out for these prophecies to be fulfilled. Uh, there had to be a nation for the Messiah to be born in. And, and um, at the time of Malachi's warning, about 430 BC, the Jews had just returned to Israel after various years, centuries of captivity. First in Assyria, and then in Babylon, and at this point, the Persian Empire ruled Israel. And at some point, you may know, if you know your, your Israel history, uh, uh, the nation of Israel had been split into a northern and a southern kingdom. And the ten, kingdom, the ten tribes out of the twelve tribes in the northern kingdom had been wiped out, which left only the southern kingdom, which only had two out of the twelve tribes. And one of those two tribes was a tribe named Judah. You will know Judah as the tribe from which King David came from. So already God had made sure that of all the tribes that were going to be decimated, that were going to be wiped off the map, the line of the stem of Jesse, the lineage of David, would survive. And then there was the, the, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, Assyrians, Babylonians, the Persians. And then a century later, in 333 BC, uh, Israel fell to the Greeks under Alexander the Great, who forced all the conquered nations to adopt the Greek language and customs, which would be important later on in, in, when, when, when the gospel went out into the greater world. And then 10 years after that, Israel fell to the Egyptians. And then in 204 BC, it fell again to the Syrian Empire. Um, the Syrians, they tried to wipe out the Jews. They desecrated the rebuilt temple, the Holy of Holies. And it looked like Israel may not survive, but they survived. God could not, would not let the nation of Israel die out because God's word had yet to be fulfilled. God protects his promises jealously and zealously. So up came a Jew, his name was Judas Maccabeus, and he led an uprising, and he took Jerusalem back for the Jews, and he rebuilt the temple, cleansed the temple. And in 63 BC, the Roman Empire took control of Israel, and the Romans did not like the Israels, they didn't treat them well. If you read your Bible, you know there's a lot of tension between the, the, the conquering empire and the locals. And so this heightened the anticipation among the Jews for a saviour. But in their mind, they weren't waiting for a, a spiritual leader. They weren't waiting for a, a, a religious figure. They were hoping for a political liberator. And the Romans didn't make it easy for the nation of Israel to survive. In uh, 47 BC, Caesar, the emperor of, 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 of Rome, he installed a man you'll know from the Bible. His name was Herod the Great uh, as, as, as king of this region. Herod the Great, just so that you know, is, is uh, born in the region, but he wasn't a descendant of Jacob, whose name is Israel. He was a descendant of a man named Esau, the twin brother of Jacob. Jacob and Esau back then were arch enemies, and, and, and along the years, they were always had enmity between the two nations of Jacob and Esau. So the Romans put an enemy as king over Israel. And I know the last three minutes sounded like a pretty hardcore history lesson. I apologize, my father used to be a history teacher, maybe it's in my genes. Dad, it's your fault. <laughs> um, it sounded like some weird crash course in world history, 
And uh, don't worry, there'll be no test. Later when you go to the coffee corner, you won't be asked who came after the Assyrians, otherwise you don't get your coffee. It may seem pretty complicated at first. I said all of this just for you to understand one thing. You don't need to remember the exact empires, the names, the Caesar this and the whatever that. You just need to remember one thing, that everything in history, everyone in the region was conspiring to wipe Israel off the map to delete them from the, the, the geographical map and to delete them from the memory of history. First the Assyrians and then the Babylonians and then the Persians and the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Syrians and then the Romans. But no matter who came after Israel trying to wipe out God's chosen people, God would not let them succeed. And they came close. It came close. They took all the people and they moved them away. Somehow God sent Cyrus to just bring them back. They came very, very close. But God made sure a remnant always remained in Israel so that Israel was never completely destroyed, wiped out. And from this we learn the simple truth that God is sovereign. God is totally in charge. God had a plan and no plan of God's will ever fail. And if we know that, if we look at history, and history tells us the same story, and if we look at the lives of, of the heroes of faith, both in the Bible and those, the people around us, and if we realize that God has a plan and no plan of His ever fails because God is sovereign, God is in charge, then the question for us must be, do we trust Him? Do we trust that God is sovereign? Do we fight against His will? or because God is sovereign and He's going to have His way no matter what, do we submit, surrender, and choose to flow with His will instead? If God wanted to preserve Israel, He did. So if God wants to preserve you, He will. If God wanted to prosper Israel, He would. If God wants to prosper you, He will. If God wants to place you somewhere in a certain country, in a specific workplace, in the family you're born into, in the community of friends that you were given, then God will do it. If God wants you to fulfill your purposes, no matter how many people are going to oppose you, all the Assyrians and the Greeks and the Romans in your life, so to speak, then God won't let them. That was the first prophecy we'll discuss today. Now for the second prophecy. And the, this, the prophecy here is that the Savior will be born in Bethlehem. Uh, we sang a lot about Bethlehem. It appeared in a lot of the Christmas carol lyrics earlier. And it comes out of this, uh, 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 um, the prophecy comes out of this verse in the book of Micah. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now, um, for this to happen, for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, importantly, Mary had to be in Bethlehem, right? Uh, it was a virgin birth but it wasn't a, 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 a transport, teleported birth. The problem with that is that Joseph and Mary didn't stay in Bethlehem. They stayed very far away. They stayed in this place called Nazareth. That's why Jesus is known as Jesus the Nazarene, right? Jesus of Nazareth. So they stayed in Nazareth, and somehow God in His cosmic plan, declaring that Jesus the Savior would be born in Bethlehem, had to get heavily pregnant Mary all the way from Nazareth to uh, Bethlehem. And that was a distance of about 200 kilometers. But as the crow flies, it's a bit shorter. It's about 140, 150 kilometers. But just to make things difficult and just to prove his power, maybe, I don't know, uh, there was this nation called Samaria, right in between Bethlehem and, Bethlehem and Nazareth. So they had to walk one big round around it because they couldn't go through the nation of Samaria. So it's a 200 kilometer walk, despite Mary being pregnant. Now, some of you will know I have many children. <laughs> Uh, uh, my wife, Joanne, she has given birth four times. I can tell you from uh, observation uh, that um, when you are in your last trimester, uh, it's sometimes hard even to make it from your bedroom to the bathroom, which is not a distance of 200 kilometers, right? So in my thinking, the only way you're going to get a super pregnant woman to go that far in a short amount of time is if you force her to move. So here's a Google Maps <laughs> to prove the distance. Uh, on the right is the, is the Google Maps version of it. So they have to go down, then they have to avoid the whole country of Samaria until finally they, they pass through Jerusalem, more or less, to get to Bethlehem down south, 
about 200 kilometers, well, 187 according to that one, but actually it's more because in this map, they wouldn't let me go past the country border. <laughs> so, so actually, it's supposed to be a bit further, right? Um, Joseph and Mary were also led by GPS. God's prophetic summons, right? So God prophetically summoned them and it came to pass in Luke chapter 2, which uh, Elder Hawkeye read earlier, right? So we won't read it in full again, but the details here are Caesar, Caesar isn't even near where they are. Caesar has no idea who Joseph and Mary are. Caesar may never have set foot in this nation before, but somewhere in his, in, probably in Rome, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone had to go to their own town to register. Joseph went up, at least down, from the town of Nazareth in Galilee, all the way to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David, as we discussed earlier. And he had to register with Mary, who by this time was, was, was expecting, fully expecting. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, that silent night, holy night. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room available at the inn. Can you start to see? I mean, we read this and we just see some details and it's a nice story. It's just, you know, fuzzy, heartwarming. But can you start to see how much work had to go into making this happen? Can you see God's hand in history to make this prophecy come to pass? First, God had to put the Romans in charge. If you think about it, that's, that's really hard work, you know. You have to make strong an empire. You have to give them some kind of global ambition. You have to, they have to somehow be able to make it all the way here. Check. Done. And then, he had to give their, their leader, Caesar, some senseless census idea, some ridiculously impractical idea. To give you an idea of what that means, it is every few years during the Malaysian elections, all the Malaysians in Singapore have to go back to their hometown to vote. Or if every Chinese New Year, you, to, to, you go back to your ancestral village in China to pay your respects. Can you imagine if every year you had to do that kind of mass multinational uh, 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 movement and everything? And not only that, God had to time the census such that Mary would reach Bethlehem just in time to feel the contractions. Because she wouldn't give birth there unless she had just reached there. Who in their right mind would go somewhere and give birth in a place where you can't even find a decent place to stay? If the timing had been wrong, they would have gone there, registered, went back to Nazareth, Jesus would have been born in Nazareth, and the whole prophecy would not have made sense. The whole prophecy would not have been true. But God's word is always true. God's word always comes to pass. Was God silent in these 400 years? No. God was moving. God was moving empires. God was moving Caesars, rulers. God was moving nations. Samira came into place. God was moving. And in Galatians 4.4, 4, it reiterates this, that there is a set time for Jesus to have been born. There was a set time when God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to be our Redeemer. God is in charge of time. He made the sun and He placed the earth to orbit around it. And therefore, the years and the seasons and the days and nights that we know, God spoke those into existence. God spoke them into creation. And similarly, thousands of years before Jesus was born, God knew exactly where and when it would happen, right down to the final weeks of the tri final trimester of Mary's birth. And as we consider how none of this can be a coincidence, and we consider God doesn't work through accidents and nothing happens by chance. And we consider the fact that He stopped at nothing to make His prophecy come to pass. Then we ask ourselves the question, if we believe it was true in the Bible, will we believe it is true for us? Do we trust that God is able to make His promises, yes and amen, come to pass? When God promises you something, whether it's in the Logos word, whether it's in the Rima, the spiritual sensing, do you doubt Him or do you just trust Him? When things happen, like it did for Joseph and Mary, that force you out of your comfort zone, heavily pregnant Mary having to travel around countries 200 kilometers, and you're forced out of your comfort zone, what goes through our minds? Do we uh, uh, indulge in self-pity? Do we get lost in this self-pity? God, where are you in my suffering? God, 
you've abandoned me? Or do we see how God's hand is always at work, always busy orchestrating events in our lives for His glory, always busy trying to shape and mould us so that we can come to our place of His intended destiny for us? Do we trust that God is able to make His promises come to pass? I said there were 300 prophecies. I'm just going to go through one more for today, right? And this third prophecy is the prophecy that the Messiah will end up in Egypt. So we heard that he went from, whoa, he went from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Uh, Egypt so far hasn't been mentioned, except it was mentioned in Hosea chapter 11, one of the Old Testament prophets, where it says, out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, for this to happen, so if you remember, poor Joseph and Mary, they've done the whole tour of Israel at this point. They've gone from north in Nazareth to south in Galilee. For this prophecy to happen now, they're going to have to go southwest into Egypt. All right? To fulfill this prophecy, God again snapped his global fingers, however it works, and another king came into place. Uh, uh, Herod, you remember Herod, from the lineage of Esau, cursed to be eternal enemies with the nation of Israel. And an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Suddenly, Egypt comes into play. Stay there until I tell you. Why? Because this crazy King Herod, this uh, insecure King Herod, this king who heard about this Jewish baby who would become king, he doesn't want to lose his own kingship, so he's going to try to hunt down this child and kill him. And because of this, Joseph gets up, he takes baby Jesus and, and, and Mary during the night, and they flee for Egypt in the middle of the night, where they stay until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son, the verse that we just read. I wonder how we would react if in the middle of the night one day, God forced us to wake up and said, for your own safety, you got to go. Because that's what happened to Joseph and Mary. Scripture doesn't record their emotional reaction. Were they happy? Were they sad? Did they grumble? Um, but they did it. They obeyed. And ultimately, as they obeyed, it was for their own good. It was for their safety. And I have to start to ask ourselves, we have to start asking, what if that was us? If God gives us a small command, I mean, this is a big fat command, you know, leave your homeland, go somewhere completely different. But when God gives us any command, any instruction, any advice, how do we respond? Do we grumble? Do we moan? Do we put up an angry post, in a passive aggressive post on Facebook about our boss? Do we refuse when God tells us? Do we trust do we accept, acknowledge, appreciate that our God is a loving God? And because He is the Lord, exercising loving kindness, always judgment and righteousness in this earth, do we trust that His plans for us are good? Romans 8.28 this church, of all churches, should know this, should be very familiar with this verse. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. That's His promise. So in these three prophecies, I hope I've given you enough evidence today to convince you that no matter what your personal experience in your life, no matter what your circumstances you've been going through in this season, understand this, that God is not silent. God cannot be silent because God is always at work. He may not be speaking in the way that we hope for. His timing may not satisfy us in our impatience, but we have to appreciate, we have to trust that God, as He said, will truly never leave us, never forsake us, and that He will leave no stone unturned for the good of us who love, of those who love Him. And today, on Christmas Day, I hope that through these examples, we can start to grasp just how great the gift of Jesus was. So meticulously planned for us. So specifically laid out for us. And God moved rulers and empires and nations to make sure that His Word came to pass. Throughout all of time, from creation until kingdom come, throughout all of the cosmos, from what happens beneath the earth up into the heavenlies, nothing happens by chance. And as we've seen the first Christmas, 
did not happen by chance. The birth of Jesus was not a coincidence. And so whatever you're going through right now, friends, God knows. He knows because He is God. He knows because He is a loving, a compassionate, a merciful God who has promised that He will not leave you in the lurch. And I know, and I've heard so many testimonies from people, and I've experienced it myself in my life, that whatever your situation might be, He will speak. He will act. Because you love Him, because He loved you first. Just ask. Because God is never silent. God speaks through His Word. God speaks through creation. And as we saw in those supposedly silent 400 years, God speaks through circumstances, through events, through divine appointments. And we don't let the circumstances define and defeat us. We remember that God is in charge of every circumstance. And as the Christmas story tells us, the circumstances He orchestrates are always in our favour. All that happened so that we would have hope in the form of baby Jesus, our Saviour and our Lord. And our job, our part, is to trust Him. That word trust, repeated again and again as we examine the, 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 the years, the timeline leading up to Christmas. Do we trust that God is sovereign? He's in charge. Do we trust that He is able to make every promise of His come to pass? And do we trust that He is loving and that whatever word, command, instruction He has for us, it is always for our good? And we ask ourselves, how might God be using the circumstances in our lives to prepare you for His intended destiny for you? How might God be speaking into your life through the events unfolding around you? Whatever it is that you might be experiencing in your life. So I'm going to close quite soon with a story about a boy who just like the baby Jesus uh, had terrible circumstances to start his life, had a terrible start uh, in his childhood. Uh, we're going to watch a video about a boy named Emmanuel. You remember the word Emmanuel earlier from the prophecies? Emmanuel means God with us. That was one of the prophecies, Jesus uh, that the Savior would be called Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, by the way, as you watch the video, um, the, the backdrop will look very familiar. It was shot in BBTC, but the actual uh, child and, and the mother are not in BBTC, so don't go around looking for Emmanuel and the mother, okay? As you watch this video, uh, I want you to consider in his family's lowest moment, when circumstances seem to be conspiring against them in every way, ask what was God really doing in Emmanuel's life? Was God silent in their pain? Or did Emmanuel's name really come to pass? Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, can we just uh, play the video? Maybe as the video plays, the worship team can start to come on stage. The first thing the doctor came out, she told me he had to transfer Emmanuel to ICU because he reacted badly with the anesthetic. We are trying to accept it that he won't be able to wake up. Even he wake up, he might not recognize who is the parents. He really cannot recognize me. I ask God, why you give me hope and you disappoint me again? What's the point to... He wake up, but he cannot recognize who is his parents, who is his mother who accompanied him during his operation. I cannot feel my leg. I thought I was dead. I 
thought I was home with Jesus. And this moment, I saw light and I was floating. I saw the pearly gates open and many angels blowing trumpet, praising God. And I saw Jesus in front of me wearing a white robe, a, a purple strip and a red crown. I bowed down before him and he said, Emmanuel, you are a believer of God. I want you to preach the gospel to all your friends who are non-Christian. When I come back, I was very happy as I have many friends. But not all are good. Some make fun of me. Like one boy said that my leg was a prosthetic leg, a fake plastic leg. I was very sad, but I have many friends who encouraged me. And one of my friends, Elvin, he came to me and said that he wanted to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And he asked me to pray for him. So I, we all kneeled down together and he said the sinner prayer. I have mixed feelings because every school holiday he have to stay in the hospital for surgery, for checkup, for all diagnosis. Unlike other kids that they can go for holiday, they can have their own. I feel very sorry for him. <laughs> but as a parent, I feel proud. I personally feel that it's a calling from God. He's very positive he's with his medical condition. La. He always tell me, Mommy, don't cry, trust God, you know. God is always there to protect me. As long as you know, he, he wants me to do, I follow his way, you know. I will be protected by him. I never blame God uh, for my condition because since he's our creator, maybe he has a reason for it. And I believe that he will not hurt me. And I believe that he has a reason for it. I don't think that I will be less able to do the task that God gave me. As I believe I have Jesus, and God will not let me die if my task was not finished. My name is Emmanuel Deron. I'm 10 years old. I want to live my life for God so that I can spread the gospel over the world. If you try to put yourself in the mother's shoes, and those of you who, par who are parents might be able to do this a little bit easier. Um, I have four children and I've probably had to stay with them overnight in the hospital four or five days in my lifetime, so far not counting births. And uh, every time you're there, even though you know it's a minor thing, you know it's a stomach thing or it's a, some kind of bump or a bruise. And if as a parent you try to put yourself in that position, and um, it feels... How much more silent do you think God could get if you are the mother looking at your son in a coma? I mean, you're facing a really literal silence. And as you look at your child, if, as, as this mom, her name is Yvang, I think, if I'm wrong, Yvang, as she looks at the child lying there, God must have seemed awfully silent at that point in her life. But what we see is that underneath that apparent silence, as for that, I don't know how many days they were in the hospital, I don't know how many days he was in a coma, God was speaking directly into Emmanuel's heart. And through the actions, through the miraculous recovery, God was doing a big work in the mother's life, telling her that even when God seems silent, 
God saying, I am never really silent. I am always working for the good of those of us who love Him. For those who are called according to my purposes. That's what God is saying. And just in case you missed Emmanuel's words, I'll repeat them one more time for you. This is what God, Emmanuel said about his situation. You know, when people are sick, the easiest thing to do is to blame God. Why, God, why did you allow this to happen? God, why was I inflicted? God, why didn't you protect me? But nine-year-old Emmanuel, when he shot this video with us, he was 10 years old already, so he's only 10. And he said this, I never blame God for my condition because since He's our Creator, maybe He has a reason for it. I believe, I trust that God will not hurt me. I don't think I'll be any less able to do the task, the purpose that God has called me to, that God gave me. God will not let me die if my task is not finished. And now Emmanuel's uh, mission in life, his, his dream is now he wants to be a pastor, if you read the story on Thirst. I want to live my life for God so that I can spread the gospel all over the world. And the circumstances for this, situ for this family were as bad as I can imagine it can be for a parent. I cannot imagine as a parent being put into a, into a more awful situation than that. And the circumstances were all set up for the mom to blame God, to rage against all of the, 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 the fates and the destinies that had, that, that had been placed upon her, to, to just be really angry and bitter and frustrated and sad. God, why aren't you speaking? God, where are you in this situation? But God was working in that family's life. So as you consider your circumstances, as you think about your past, the, 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 the baggage that you still hold on to, the, the wounds that were inflicted onto you, as you weigh the good and the bad that is currently in your life, and whatever might be happening to you at your workplace, whatever might be happening to you in your family life, some relationship gone not so good, Something that you hope for, something that you pray for, not quite there yet. The choice is ours. We can dismiss the presence of God in our life. Or we can acknowledge and accept it. We can despair at our circumstances. Or we can focus on our part, which is consecrating ourselves to trust God. You can fight against the will of God or we can learn to flow with God. And the silence before Christmas led to the most amazing gift of all, the baby who would be our saviour, Jesus Christ. And we saw in Emmanuel's mom that silent struggle as a child's illness went from, from bad, from a serious critical condition and into a coma. And out of that struggle, the redemptive journey which strengthened the faith convictions of mother and child. Now Emmanuel, he wants to spread the gospel. Now Emmanuel's job is to tell everyone else who might be suffering in silence, Emmanuel, God is with us. Hold on to Him. Trust Him. Church, God is with us. For every day that you have lived, that life you lived was life breathed into you by Him. For every breath that you have breathed, God was always standing right there beside you, with you. And know this, that God created you wonderfully. And God loves you, loved you, will always love you deeply. And God wants you to draw near to Him desperately. Will you trust Him with your life and your circumstances? Because He's not silent when it comes to how much He loves you. He has said it from the beginning and it repeats every day in the Bible where it says that God so loved the world that He gave His Son, Jesus Christ, His only Son, on Christmas Day to be born into this earth for the sole purpose of dying. But not just dying, but He would conquer death and He would take with us His sin. And in His resurrection, He would give us new life as well. Those who were baptized today, 
you understand this. I hope your friends and your family here understand this. That you go into the waters of baptism, it's a symbol of washing away the old and coming out as a new creation with the new life that is breathed into you by the Holy Spirit. That whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That was the work of all of that work that God did to make that first Christmas happen. And today the call for us is to respond to His invitation, to His outstretched arm today. Nothing happens by chance. I believe those of you who are in this church for the first time are not here by chance. And I hope that you would hear the word that God has laid into your heart today.